I'm Frederick Lumiere, the uh, director and editor of Someone You Love, the HPV epidemic. And I'm Mark Hefty, and I'm a writer and producer of Someone You Love. Well, if, if there were three things that um, I would want people to take away from the film, at least, uh, the first would be make sure that your daughters uh, get vaccinated. The second would be make sure your boys are vaccinated. And the third would be make sure that you stay on top of your screenings, pap smears, and HPV tests. That would be the takeaway. But as far as HPV goes, so the most important thing, or mm -hmm. the... I mean, what I think people should know is that it's just so prevalent. You know, almost almost everybody has HPV or will get it at some point. And there's sh so because of that, there shouldn't be a stigma behind that. Um, if somebody has HPV, we should just consider the fact that everybody has it. So now it's something in society we have to deal with. So mm -hmm. let's deal with it. Exactly. Well, yes, uh, there were a lot of things that I discovered that were surprising to me. The first, though, um, is how prevalent it was, because I really knew nothing about HPV before I made this film, and Mark is the one who um, told me about HPV. But I, I really had no idea how prevalent it was, and we're talking 80, 90 percent of people under the age of 50 will have HPV at some point in their lives. And that was shocking to me, because then I started thinking, but wait a minute, in my 20s and 30s, you know, there's a very good chance I could have been a carrier of something I had no idea existed and caused cancer, six cancers, that is, including cervical cancer. So that was the, the most shocking thing for me, personally. When we started learning, we really found out, like, for instance, 162 or something strains mm -hmm. of HPV are out there, and and it's so prevalent, like, like Frederick said, but really there's two strains that cause the majority of uh, cancers, cervical cancers and other HPV-related cancers, and that's HPV-16 and HPV-18. And really those two types cover about 70% of cervical cancers. And by eliminating these two strains through vaccination, you really can cover a lot of the cervical cancer, just those two strains alone can, can mm -hmm. really cover yourself against uh, preventing or you can really prevent cervical cancer. And now you have, so you now have a new vaccine, uh, Garcel 9, which covers even more strains. So it covers nine strains. Um, but the other thing that was also surprising is how this one virus, different strains of it, cause many more cancers. They cause anal cancer, oral cancer, and oral cancer in men is starting to become something that people are paying attention to. Um, the other thing that was also surprising is how cervical cancer was transmitted. It's not just through intercourse, it's also it's skin to skin. So brushing, uh, some of the latest study in, in Canada showed that even kissing, you could transmit HPV, definitely oral sex. So um, it's one of the most transmitted, sexually transmitted infection, and it causes cancer. And then finally, to, to answer your question, the, the thing that really put me over the edge was that is all preventable. I mean, here are six cancers that are caused by a virus and it's trans and it's preventable. And yet, only thir between 30 to 40 percent of people in America are actually vaccinating their kids, or 40 percent of kids in America are being vaccinated. And so that was shocking. And that's really one of the main reasons we wanted to make this film is because the opportunity for social change and saving lives was, was huge. I think there's a bunch of things that people can take away from this. And, you know, one of them is that if you have HPV or if you have cervical cancer, there's nothing wrong. I mean, there's nothing mm. socially wrong with you. You're, everybody has it, and it's one of those things. So if you eliminate the stigma behind it, then you can start really talking and having an open discussion. And mm -hmm. I think that what we're trying to do with this film is make it more comfortable for people to have this discussion and talk about it and say, in the years past, people wouldn't even talk about breast cancer before Susan G. Coleman and all these, you know, now football players are wearing 
pink shoes and games and stuff like that, and people can talk about it, and then, and then a change can happen. So what we're trying to do is make that a little more comfortable mm -hmm. for people to talk about and say, oh, I saw a documentary on cerebral cancer, and they can talk about it, talk about getting vaccinated and getting screened and telling people to go get checked up for you know, get your gynecological screenings. It's all very important, and that's what we want to do, is just really sort of put it on the table and let people mm -hmm. discuss it. Yeah, and, um, and, and you know, um, the people we followed in the film were very generous, and they shared their lives with us, um, and including Kelly, who, you know, I think a lot of people know now, she passed, she passed away and she died. And she really opened her heart and said, you know, um, it's too late for me, but I really want people to understand that cervical cancer can be dangerous. This is not something to play around with. And, and so she was incredibly generous um, because she was hoping that it would save other people's lives. And then what I would say to parents, if you're on the fence with the HPV vaccine, you probably have some valid reasons. Just watch the film. Watch the film, educate yourself, learn about the numbers, learn about you know, the, the prevalence, like the, the stigma, for instance. I mean, why is there a stigma about a virus that 80% of people have at some point in their lives? The stigma is not really against people with HPV. It's, about, it's with people who have a reaction from HPV to what most of us have. So uh, the takeaway really here is watch the film, even if you're very anti-vaccinating your kids for HPV, because most parents who have watched the film, once they see it and once they understand the science behind it and the human toll of what cervical cancer can have, uh, most of them come back and say, you know what, I'm going to get my kids vaccinated. And, and to us, you know, it, it makes Kelly's sacrifice, because that is a sacrifice. You know, most people, when, they, when they're terminal, you know, they kind of retreat, they close their doors, they stay with their families. She kept it open for the camera to see it all. Um, and that's, that's a huge sacrifice, but it, it leads to saving lives. So watch the film. And you know, people, especially here in the U.S., will talk, say it's not a, cervical cancer is not really a problem anymore. There's 4,000 women-ish a year die from cervical cancer in the U.S. But it's really so much more than that, mm -hmm. and that's what you'll see from the, from the film, is that it, it affects lives and relationships. It's a huge thing. Almost everybody in the film, actually, every, well, aside from Kristen, but uh, all the ladies we interviewed in the film had effects of their relationships, divorces and you know, breaking up with their significant others after they were diagnosed or found out they had HPV, and then especially cervical cancer, because along with the there's uh, other things like uh, hysterectomies that happen, which is huge. There's, sorry. Um, so along with just the mortality numbers that exist around cervical cancer, so many other things happen. I mean, there's, you're talking about hysterectomies, other physical ailments that come from the treatments, from successful treatments of cervical cancer. And then relationship issues is a really big thing. Mm -hmm. you know, um, it's, it's such an intimate and personal problem, and it affects relationships in a big deal, in intimacy and uh, marriages and mm -hmm. whatnot. So to build a little bit on what Mark was talking about, so, so you have the people who die of cervical cancer. And it's true that 4,000 women, not, not to, you know, to, to Kelly's family, cervical cancer is 100% mortality, right, <laughs> for her case. But, uh, yeah, it is not the biggest killer, but you think about the hysterectomy, like Mark was saying, you think about losing your womb, what that does to women, but also think about the, the, the treatment, radiation treatment, chemotherapy, and the, the lasting effects of that. That's, that's devastating even to a body um, and to the health of people. So, but the, the thing that is most important to, to say here is cervical cancer doesn't have to happen. If you get screened, so if you're lucky enough and you can get the vaccine because you're young enough, that's great. But if you're too old for the vaccine, Cervical cancer can be caught on time before it becomes cancer. It's very, very treatable. You know, if you catch cervical cancer when it's dysplasia, SIN 1, SIN 2, the, the success rate of, of rating, getting rid of the, uh, of the uh, HPV activity in your body is very, very high. So it's very treatable if it's caught on time, but that means you, as a woman, have a responsibility to stay on top of your checkups.
So it took exactly two years to film, almost to the to the day. Um, but obviously, the editing and the pre-production is much longer. So it's almost a three-year process. So yeah, and Kelly, we wanted to find somebody who was going through live as we're watching it, going through her treatments and everything that goes along with it, the personal side as well as the physical mm -hmm. and medical side. So Kelly was kind of becomes our main character that you're seeing go, go through it all. And originally she was supposed to be a, a success story of ours. So the, the last scene, and if you haven't seen the movie, then <laughs> I don't want to give it away, but the, the last scene is uh, very close before Kelly uh, died. It, it was just a few days before. And, and when we were told by her family that she was getting really close, you know, we called her and said, Kelly, we, we really want to come and see you to say goodbye. And we weren't going to bring a camera. We said, you know, we don't have to film it. That's fine. And she said, and she was having such a difficult time, you know, texting and, and, and talking. She couldn't even talk on the phone. And she said, uh, if you're coming back, you're bringing your damn camera. <laughs> I really want you to, to film this. And so in that last interview, um, you know, Kelly was very positive. Not only was she positive, but also she was kind of bossy in a very good way. That's what she was driven. I mean, you look at how much she's accomplished just in the time of her advocacy that she was forced into. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, she was the the first guest on the Jeff Probst show, and but but she always wanted to remain positive. She had stickers and notes in her bathroom with positive thoughts. She thought that her mind had to participate in the fight against her cancer, and she was, you know, right. But um, and she very rarely cried in interviews. Um, but that last interview. She cried the whole time. I mean, she was in tears the whole time because she knew it was over. There was nothing else she could do. And she felt that she had lost that battle. And, you know, when you do an interview, and Mark does the, the interviewing, he's the one who asked the question, what do you tell someone who is dying because they know, I'm sorry, what do you tell somebody who is crying because they are dying? There's not much you can tell them. You can't tell them, you know, it's going to get better, time will heal. You, you don't have any of these canned answers to tell him. But what Mark said, he said to her, Kelly, we're going to show this to as many people as we can, and your story is going to save lives. And then she smiled. That was the only smile she gave us in that one last interview. And so the answer to your question is that it meant an incredible amount. The only thing she had left was that her story and her message could save lives. Kelly actually saw uh, a rough cut of the film before she passed away, and obviously didn't have the ending because. But she knew that she was part of this ending, and she loved it. You know, she she was very happy to be a part of this film and to see her place in it and know that she can make a difference. And really, you know, she she doesn't know, I guess, the extent of the outcome of the film and what she can mm -hmm. do. But I think she she knew in a sense like she dreamt it you know with us like she saw the vision and she saw what we were trying to do and get it to as many people as possible and that's really the goal and that's hopefully uh, we can all help spread that message and get it out there and get it to as many people as possible that's what we're trying Frederick has really set up a, a great different opportunities to show the film to get it out there for people to, to show it in small groups at home on your computer or at big big screenings we're really trying to get it out there and use uh, very creative uh, ways to to get people to see it because you know honestly it's tough like who it's tough to get somebody to watch a film about HPV and cervical cancer you know, it, it's just something people get a little uncomfortable with but the reality is it's a human interest story and it's something that could affect us all and could affect your children and just to know this, to be educated, it's power. And I think Kelly knew this, and she, we feel like we owe it to her as well to get this out there. And not just Kelly, all the women in the film. That's right. Uh, there's th three, three ladies who are huge advocates, uh, who are survivors, survivors of cervical cancer, uh, Susie Carrillo, uh, Christine Bays, and Tamika Felder. And they're all everyday their, their lives are all about 
being champions f for cervical cancer. And then also Kristen Forbes, who was 23 when she passed away from cervical cancer. Her family now, uh, Kirk and Brendan For Brenda Forbes, excuse me, are huge advocates years later after their daughter passed away and trying to get this message out. And they're really big about pushing the vaccine mm -hmm. and letting them know for their children that get your kids vaccinated because their 23-year-old daughter died of cervical cancer. So really everybody involved, we feel like we owe it to them as well as the rest of the world and the rest of other people going through this to get this out there and to make sure it doesn't have to happen. We want this to sort of be the polio of, of years past where you can eliminate it. I mean, I know polio still exists in some areas, but for the most part, we can, we can eliminate cervical cancer. It's gonna take some time and it's gonna take a lot of effort and hopefully we can play a, a small part in that. Mm -hmm. so, so the future of eradicating cervical cancer is vaccination because that's how you eliminate for the next generation. And the Forbes family are very big on pushing or at least promoting and, and educating about vaccination because their daughter died you know, in her early 20s and she had a pap smear just months before she was diagnosed with cervical cancer. So the only thing that could have saved her was the vaccine and it's the same for Kelly. The only thing that could have saved her is the vaccine. So we're not saying that screening is not important, it's huge, but vaccination is the future of eradicating cervical cancer. And Frederick and I really had no, like, when we first came into this, we didn't have a stance necessarily on, no. on vaccination. We didn't know, like, even at one point we were like, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, we, should, you know, we didn't really know, but the more we learned and the more we found out, like every expert we talked to was so pro-vaccine. Every, everybody we talked to, it, it just, and then it became clear to us, this is the only way to really make a huge global impact on, on this problem is through vaccination and now we now we understand and we're not paid by Merck or anyone else or any other vaccine companies to say this we just understand for That's ourselves right. that this is from a social health perspective this is, vaccination is the it's only a way we can we can do with it yeah I mean it, it, the, the history of vaccine is really a, a miracle vaccine it's a vaccine against cancer and and when like Mark was saying when we entered this topic when we researched it we looked into the science, we looked into the allegations of how the vaccine was unsafe, and we realized it was all unfounded, and the experts who had really no interest in, in supporting a vaccine that would be hurting people showed to us how safe it was. And so that's the outcome of the film, is that it ends up being very pro-vaccine, but it could have easily not been had we discovered something different. I, under I understand I actually understand the people, the anti-vaxxers and people who are against vaccines. I get it, you know, parents, they're parents who love their kids and who are very, just want to make sure they protect their family as much as possible. But you know, if you really look at it, if that's the logic, you want to protect your family as much as possible, then you, you can protect your kids from a virus that causes a cancer and kills a lot of people and potentially five other cancers. So it's if you want to talk about protecting your kids, that's to me seems to be the way to go. And it's really all about the numbers, isn't it? I mean, you're looking at a virus that impacts 80% of people, assuming most of these people will have a sexual relationship at some point in their lives, right? Out of those 80%, 90% will get rid of the virus on its own but 10% won't, right? So these are the numbers you're looking at. 80% and then 10% of those will have HPV, will develop into something that needs to be taken care of and potentially cancer. Now let's look at vaccines. Okay, vaccine, talking about vaccines in general, it's one in a million will have a serious side effect. Okay, um, aspirin is 10 in 10,000 will have a serious side effect. But we don't think twice about taking aspirin. So it's really all about the numbers. Look at the numbers, educate yourself. Like Mark said, we get it. You're anti-vaccine, it's fine, but please, really, educate yourself objectively, and I guarantee you that you will come out of this saying, you know what, this is a worthwhile bet.
want to let the writer answer that question. <laughs> so each woman has a, is at a different point in her cervical cancer struggle in our film. And it really... So we wanted to have a, some people who had been through it, who had, who had gone through the disease and is on the other, are on the other side and can sort of be a voice uh, in retrospect talking about what they went through and sort of maybe even give advice to the other ladies in the film. And then we also wanted some, somebody to be going through, like Kelly, who was going through the procedures at the time and live as you're watching it. Because then as an audience, we can also go along with them in the story and feel what she's feeling as she's going through it. And it's just more powerful. And, you know, Frederick really wanted to f make sure we we found that. And, we, you know, we, we looked. And then Kelly, we found Kelly. And, you know, mm -hmm. Frederick talked to her online. And she actually sent uh, sort of an audition video talking about what she just found out, that she had cervical cancer and um, talked about it. And she's, Kelly was so articulate and so she, open and just willing to talk about every little detail of yeah. what she was going through that we knew she was, she was the person that we wanted. We actually ended up following three other ladies who aren't in the film. And because you don't really know what you're going to get from each, peop from each person. And one of the ladies, her name is Michelle Baldwin, we followed her and she actually passed away also from cervical cancer. And we, we decided to keep her on our own documentary. So now we're making a film called uh, Lady Ganga, which uh, is about Michelle's story. And it's a, it's a pretty fascinating story about her, this woman with cervical cancer who uh, broke a world record in order to make a difference and, and went to India. But a whole other story. Anyway, uh, back to someone you love, we, Kelly was going through this process and that was the main thing what we needed and then we needed other people and Kristen Forbes had already passed away and this became more about her family because we wanted to show what families have to deal with because it's a big thing it's not just the person involved it's everybody mm -hmm. that they love and so we had the family of Kristen uh, and then we told we tell Kristen's story in retrospect through home videos and um, and then we had the three ladies going through it and then Kelly and we felt that that was a fairly round, uh, full story that we could, we could tell people with, mm. with those people. And we also had all of the uh, medical experts try to get somebody from sort of each point of view from the medical side, including uh, we had a Professor Harold Zurhausen, who is a Nobel Prize winner. He's discovered that HPV caused cervical cancer. And went to Germany and interviewed him and we, we we tried to get as broad of a perspective as we could on this and I think we I think we did. Mm -hmm. So just one more thing to add to this is um, when we looked at the problem of HPV at least in America we also discovered that um, it um, was a much bigger problem in the African American and the Latino community and so we got very lucky I mean we found one of the best advocates in cervical cancer in the country is Tamika Felder, who has Survivor, who's an African American. And she put us in touch with Susie Carrillo, who was, who still is, <laughs> a uh, Latina um, from um, Los Angeles area. And so we were also b able to tell those stories through their personal experiences. And it was important for us to say that because when you look at the numbers, it, it's quite staggering. You know, um, African Americans in America are, I think, at least twice as likely to die of cervical cancer than Caucasians. And the problem is also um, a cultural problem, problem when it comes to the Latino community. Uh, cultural because um, even going to the gynecologist is not something that's encouraged in those families. And so all of this is changing, and that's great, but we wanted to tell those stories to, to help push the change um, so it changes a little faster. <laughs> And something people ask me often, is it's not that African-American or Latino women have a higher prevalence of HPV no. or cervical cancer, yeah. but they just don't go get checked up as frequently uh, the, the, in general, the numbers say. And therefore, when they do go in, it's generally late stage. Mm -hmm. And the problem with cervical cancer is if you don't catch it in the three phases of precancer, 
it's very tough to manage once it becomes cancer, mm -hmm. and the outcome is. That's right. Always, you know, but the numbers are the numbers from the CDC mm -hmm. are quite shocking when you look at how when you look at the, the same segment of the population. So you take a hundred women who have cervical cancer who are Caucasian, a hundred women who are um, um, Native um, African American. Uh, twice as many African Americans will die from it, and that's because less access to care. Um, I know, um, so th there's a lot of reasons, but they need to be informed. They need to be, you know, and services need to be provided for them, and that's what Tamika is doing. And so she's a big part of the film, and, and such a great voice for cervical cancer awareness in general, but specifically in the Afri uh, African American communities. Yeah, and obviously all communities need to know this. Of course. And, you know, that's also part of the reason uh, yeah. we also chose Vanessa Williams to narrate the film. We felt she really represented a, a perfect demographic of what we were looking at here. And um, aside from having a, a wonderful voice, she's also a really great person and really cares about the subject. But also, you know, the one of the important aspects of this are women over 30 and mm -hmm. to tell to tell them that you know if you get checked up keep on your pap smears keep you know getting checked up get your HPV tests and your your pap tests so we're not trying to make an alarmist film here and get people freaked out about oh they're going to die of cervical cancer it's not the case it's it's almost the opposite we're trying to let people know that you know HPV is something everybody has and it's something that if you take care of and you're on top of, you stay up with your tests and you get your kids vaccinated, it doesn't have to be alarming. It, it's just right. something that we can deal with kind of like it's a, a common cold or something at some point. It's a very hopeful film, I mean, because the opportunity is incredible. Mm -hmm. The opportunity to eradicate these cancers is right before us. And when people get educated and inspired, they do that. They get involved. You know, it's always tough. You, 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 have, you have to make cuts. You have to make a film digestible, meaning it has to be less than 10 hours, <laughs> at least. So yes, the answer is there are a lot of things I wish I could have included in the film. Um, but you know, at some point we have to make decisions um, because you, know, you can reach a point where you give too much information and then it's counterproductive because people start having the glazed look. You know, it's just too much, it's too much. But you could really make a whole series about HPV and cervical cancers and all the other ca uh, cervical ca uh, HPV related cancers. The men's perspective, for instance, and oral cancer and, and, and penile cancer and all of these other cancers that are caused by HPV um, would grant its own film because you know oral cancer is a big problem. Um, when you look at the numbers about um, people who have HPV in, in the mouth, I forget what the exact number is, and we say that in the documentary, but it's, it's again, pretty shocking. Um, and predominantly, it's white males in their 60s who are getting HPV-related oral cancers. So that's a, a whole other topic. Um, you know, the, the toughest thing is to not tell someone stories that you've filmed. And like Mark was saying, you know, Bonnie, she had anal cancer, which was HPV-caused. But at some point, we had to make a decision that we wanted to make a, a film about cervical cancer, and we had to kind of focus on that. That was a very, very tough decision because, you know, Bonnie passed away in the middle of the production as well. And, um, and so we will probably make um, a small version um, of Bonnie's story for the web. She has a website which we're, we're helping to keep alive, uh, which is very informational. And so, but yeah, there's a lot of things I, I wish we would have included, but at some point you gotta make the cuts for the, for the benefit of the story and to make sure it's still entertaining and interesting and educational. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. The, the thing to me that, you know, you spend so much time with these people and you, you end up finding out some very interesting things about their lives and what's going on. And originally, a big part of Kelly's story was gonna be her relationship uh, and how her relationship was affected from by her diagnosis, and that was one thing we, you know, that was kind of our mm -hmm. direction at first. And then once she was, we found out she was probably going to die from this. 
we had to foc you know, change our focus on her story. And so there's a lot of info there, and because it's all interesting to me, how like psychologically how it affects people and how it affects relationships is very very interesting because it's just something that people don't talk mm -hmm. about as much with this. You know, you look at the numbers. I was saying earlier, you know, look at the mortality rates and all this stuff. But it's so much more than that. There's, you know, this is something people have to deal with the rest of their lives. And our survivors in the film, you know, Christine Bays and Tamika Felder and Susie Carrillo, they, they all talk about how this is something that now they have to deal with for the rest of their lives. I mean, uh, just the physical side, side effects are pretty shocking, and they talk about them, and, mm -hmm. and they're very open about the sexual side effects as well that go along with it, which affects intimacy in their relationship. So to me, that was, that was a big thing that I, I wish we could have even gotten into a little more. We, we do get into it a bit, but um, that's big. And, and also just so much information out there. And like Frederick said, it gets a little confusing. You put too much in there, and then you just hear numbers, and it's confusing. And, but some of the experts had some really, really great stuff, and, and I wish we could have wish we could have included it all. And the other thing, you know, what's really challenging making a film like this is having the entertainment aspect as well as the medical aspect and combining them and making it interesting and so people are still, I guess, entertained and want to keep the, keep the TV on as you're watching it. And um, I think we really tried to put a very equal, if not maybe even more of a human interest story in there as well as the information. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I think when people watch it, they're almost not expecting it to have as much of a story, people story, as it really is, because that's what it's about. It's about people, mm -hmm. you know. And and like any uh, like any other film we've made, we wanted this to be an educational tool. So we really went out of our way to break down the facts about HPV and then to deliver them in a very digestible and easy way to understand. And we're finding today that the film is being used as a tool by physicians, by, by educa uh, educators, by health professionals, and they are hosting screenings because it answers so many questions about HPV and cervical cancer, which is great. So you'll get interested and entertain if that's the word, because I can't find another word. But also you'll walk away with a, a lot stronger understanding of what HPV and cervical cancer is. And that was a, a big deal for us because we didn't want just people to freak out and walk out and say, oh, what is this HPV thing? It looked horrible and these people had terrible experiences. We also wanted to let them understand that it doesn't have to be scary and here's why. And, here, and then we even go into the history of HPV, the discovery of HPV um, and cervical cancer and that link and so forth. So, so yeah, it's much more educational than other films that we've made, much more. Another thing I think to me that we almost t is too much to get into in this film was this was a very pointed, very American, very U.S. based mm -hmm. domestic problem of HPV and cervical cancer. And that was sort of our focus. And we kind of needed to have that focus of just cervical cancer, just you know HPV, cervical cancer, and in the U.S. But really it's such a huge problem worldwide. And we, we couldn't really get into that in this film. Um, 250 plus thousand women die globally every year from cervical cancer alone. And it, it's a huge problem worldwide. You know, people do, they just don't get checked up. And by the time they do go in, in underdeveloped countries, it's too late. And um, so one of the women we followed had more of a global story because she went to India. Uh, India is has one of the highest mortality rates from cervical cancer and she wanted to promote this and so she went to India broke a world record by paddle boarding down the the Ganges River in India and we decided to take her story and make it her own film so in that other film it's called Lady Ganga which would, will be out soon is re that's really focusing on the global problem of HPV and cervical yeah. cancer whereas someone you love the HPV epidemic is U.S. domestic problem. So we would have liked to include that probably all in one film, but it was just so much. And, and the story, Michelle Baldwin is the Lady Ganga, Ganga story. She, um, she, what happens in her story, it just reaches out to the world. And it's quite fascinating, actually, in, in how 
this one person can really affect things all around the country, uh, around the world. So we're very excited about this film, Lady Ganga. So if you're interested, go to ladygangathemovie.com mm -hmm. and soon ladygonga.org, and then you'll find out a lot more about it. But like Mark said, it's, it's about the global problem of HPV and cervical cancer. Personally, it was incredibly difficult to make this film. Um, you know, it, I, I think the, the most difficult part of making it is that once this friend, who, who we, Kelly became our friend, who was just, I mean, we were very good friends. She shared everything with us. She would call us first when she had a question or when she had a problem. And we spent so much time together. You know, we became really good friends. Once that friend is gone, we're left with the pieces, right? And we're left with the pieces of her story, and then we have to put that together to honor her and, and do right by her story. And, and, if you're, and that's incredibly difficult. That's a lot of pressure. That's huge pressure because she's not there to to give her feedback, she's not there to, to say yay or nay, and, and you have a certain expectation for it. No, this is about life and death. <laughs> this, is not, you know, this is not a comedy. And, and so you, if you're not careful as an artist, you can have too high of expectations and you'll never be satisfied. And I don't know how many cuts we've been through, but we went through so many cuts in the edit that we weren't satisfied with. And at some point, we had to realize, OK, we've got to make decisions. Because we're not helping anybody by keeping the film in the edit suite. It needs to be out there. So the answer, yeah, it's incredibly difficult because you miss your friend and, and you set a certain expectation for the film that might be unrealistic as a result of, of the emotion attached to the subject matter. And what, one of the other things is that you, in particular, as an editor, too, you have to deal with it over and over again. You're watching yeah. it. Mm. You, know, you go through it live as we're interviewing Kelly, and you're watching her deteriorate, and you see that, and it's bad enough watching it in person. It's horrible. And then you have to go back, and first I started with it on paper, and I'm re going through all of her interviews and mm. reliving all of it again, over and over again, and then you're cutting it down and trying to figure out what to use. And like Frederick said, it's, it's a lot of pressure knowing that this is going to be this person's legacy and their last last word that you know is there forever for people to see. And then and then it goes to Frederick, who's editing all the seeing all the footage and seeing all of you know seeing it right there and seeing Kelly all day long for months as you're editing it, going through it over and over again. I think that does create a little emotional turmoil in a sense, and you have to. Luckily, Frederick and I are also best friends, so we could call each other and sort of talk about it. And since we both experienced it together, and which definitely helped. But the film, for me, also, and I think for both of us, really, aside from the that side of it, the emotional side, it also kind of has changed the trajectories of our career a little bit as well. You know, we knew nothing about mm. HPV and cervical cancer and the other cancers HPV causes going into this. And it was very sort of random how it happened. And, and now we've spent three plus years of our lives talking about it and you know, learning about it. And suddenly, through osmosis, you kind of become a, a you know, subject matter expert on, in the field and that we never planned on. You know, yeah. like I, if you would have told us four years ago that we would be here talking about HPV, we'd, we would have said you were crazy. But um, but now when we see it, it creates, it becomes something powerful in your life then. And it becomes something that you see that you, there's an opportunity here to have a big effect on the world. And that's what we've always been looking for. You know, we've always, in our, in our careers, we've wanted to do things that make people think, make people feel something, make, somehow make a little bit of change, social change, personal change, whatever that means. And I think this has given us a bit of a focus where we can see, you know, look at we have six cancers there that don't have to exist, and we can maybe be a small part in trying to 
eliminate those. And that, so that's, that's where it, what it's done for us. It's given us sort of a platform to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And we hope that we can succeed in that. Yeah, one more thing on that. It, it, most films before this, you know, we would finish it, we would distribute it and, and launch it. This film is, is like our baby. I mean, we, we put a whole program around it where people can screen the film in communities. People can buy bulk versions of the film for one dollar and then donate those versions. So we're coming up with all these creative ways where the film can be seen by as many people as possible. And we didn't just deliver it to a TV network where they could have this film as one of thousands. We are holding on to it because we want to make sure that the promise we made to Kelly, which is we're going to do everything we can for as many people as possible to see this film, is something we deliver on.